Welcome back to uh, Bethel Baptist Fellowship and uh, this Wednesday night service for uh, these days here at the end of the month of April. And um, as I have tried and attempted to say each night, how thankful, grateful, genuinely from the bottom of my heart for the privilege I've had through this online means to be able to seek to hold up the Word of God to God's people and say, here's what the Word of God says. Now, what are we going to do with this? We need to obey it. We need to uh, recognize what the Lord is trying to tell us. What a great book He's given us. I don't know if you've been with us every single night, every single service since Sunday. I hope you have. If not, we're, we're just glad that you're here with us tonight. And as we end uh, our time together uh, for this virtual revival meeting, I, I pray that it has been a spiritual shot in the arm for each one who have joined us for these services. Tonight, I want you to take your Bible. I say it every night. Please take your Bible and uh, go to an extremely familiar passage of Scripture, Romans chapter 12. Romans 12 is a passage that opens up the doorway for us as we begin to see uh, the more practical application of the letter to the church at Rome. The first 11 chapters have been heavily doctrinal in nature. Paul, the human author, has been guided by the Lord himself, the Spirit of God, to instruct God's people with doctrinal training and doctrinal teaching as to who we are in Christ and how we got to be a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, uh, tonight, in this service, I want us to see what the Bible has to say with reference to the matter of, so if this is true, and it is, that Jesus saves and that He has saved you, then how should that be fleshed out in our lives? I know that Romans 12 is a passage that maybe you've heard uh, someone teach from many times, maybe from a youth meeting of uh, times in the past, or maybe uh, sometime in, in uh, some S Sunday school training or some other training and teaching time at your church. Tonight we're going to go back and look at it once again, and I, I pray that it will be timely and helpful for you personally. Would you just simply notice the first few verses of the chapter? It simply says this. Now, I know you know it, but follow along. It says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren. Can we just stop right there? And let me just pause and say that what he is saying here is that I am pleading with you. I, I'm on my knees begging you to listen to what I'm about to say. That's what Paul is saying. And then he says, therefore, I beseech you, therefore. Now, why is that word, therefore, there? He's saying, because of everything I've said in the previous 11 chapters, everything, of course, he didn't say 11 chapters, but he said, in the previous teaching that I've given to you, therefore, as a result of, of the depravity of mankind and the salvation of Jesus Christ alone and the change that that has brought to your life, therefore, Here's what ought to be in your life, brethren. Keep reading. By the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove, that is to understand and discern, what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We'll stop right there. We're going to pick it up and look at some more verses in the passage. Friends, this is a great passage talking about finding out why you, why I, why we are here on planet Earth for such a time as this. These are unique days. You know that's true. Uh, we can't gather together as a congregation, no groups larger than 10 people, and even that needs to be socially distant apart. I understand all that, and you do as well, as we try to deal with this uh, age of a pandemic that has swept across the globe. But you may ask yourself, what, what value is there to my life? I personally believe that these days, 
may open up a brand new door of spiritual awareness and hungering and thirsting by people all across the globe for the, the question that has haunted every man, and that is, why am I here? And where am I going? What's going to happen when it's all said and done? I think eternity and life and death issues have become something that man is much more aware of. Well, let me make it more pointed for you. Why are you here? In Romans 12, we have an explanation that just jumps off the page, just leaps out at us to show us what it is that we're to do, or more importantly, what we're to be. Uh, the story is told that the the old great British preacher Charles Spurgeon went to visit a lady that was a very poor lady, a member of his church back in the days in which Spurgeon was alive. As he went over to see this dear old lady, he sat down and fellowshiped with her and talked with her, and he was it was obvious that she was living in poverty, and it was obvious that. Um, uh, she was nearing the end of her life, and uh, as they sat and talked, after a moment, Spurgeon, the pastor, looked up on the wall, and he saw up on her bare wall one framed item, a certificate, actually. He went over and looked at that certificate and began to read it. He turned and he looked at that lady, and he said, Madam, have you ever met a man by the name of, now I, I don't remember the man's name, but uh, let me just make something up. Do you remember a man by the name of Ben Harrison? And uh, she said, uh, why sure, pastor, I remember Ben Harrison. He's been dead for a long time. I used to take care of him. I used to be kind of a, a nurse's aide. I, aide. I'd go over to his house and prepare meals for him. And and uh, comfort him in his uh, last remaining months on earth and uh, keep him warm by putting a blanket over him as he would sleep in his, in his chair. Spurgeon said, Madam, do you know what's on this certificate? She said, no, Pastor, I can't read. She said, I got that in the mail many years ago. And she said, I just thought it was an attractive certificate. I put it in a frame that I found here in my, on my house property put it up on the wall just to kind of give it some beauty up there. He said, Madam, this certificate tells us that you are the owner of that man's entire wealth, his estate, everything he owned, he willed to you. Out of shock, the lady said, Please don't play with me, Pastor. That can't be true. He was an extremely wealthy man, more wealth than I could ever imagine. And Spurgeon said, Madam, it now belongs to you. And you never checked up on it. They did check up on it. And the uh, attorneys and bankers said, well, we wondered who the lady was and what whatever happened to her. Yes, it now all belongs to her. Now, my first thought when I hear a story like that is this. Why doesn't anything like that ever happen to me? But then secondly, it draws me back to understand that God, the creator of all things, the divine authority of God says to you, to me, I have given to you giftings in order to do what I've given you the responsibility to do. You say, do what, Morris? I'm not following you. Go back to our passage in Romans 12. Would you notice what it says? Look, it says, it says in verse 3, For I say through the grace given unto me, Paul says. Now look, he says, I've been given a grace gift, uh, an empowerment, a strength from God. By the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. For as just like we have many members in one human body, uh, but all members have not the same office or the same responsibility. He says, uh, verse 5, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, 
let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Or ministry, let us wait on our ministering. Or he that teacheth on teaching. Or he that exhorteth on exhortation. He that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence. And he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. Now, wait a minute. What in the world is going on here? Paul tells us in this passage that God has given us gifts, giftings. He has put together a particular blend of giftings for you, and he's made you, and he's made me. He's made us a distinct divine creation of God. You see, when Jesus Christ came into your life and you accepted Him as Savior, the Spirit of God came within you and He gave to you giftings. To do what? To impact the world that you live in. I said to you, I think on Sunday night, in Sunday night's message, if not, maybe it was Monday night's, I said to you that the church I'm talking about each individual in the church. The, the, the church of the living God is to be an army, not an audience. That is, we are to take what God has given to us. Certainly, He's given to us eternal life. But now we don't just sit around and say, well, I'll just wait till Jesus comes. Friends, God has gifted you to serve Him to impact this world. There's no one that's ever been like you. Never. Uh, there, there's sometimes a, an artist that comes on the old uh, 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 broadcast of television and public broadcasting in which he takes a mix of colors. He takes a palette of colors and he blends them together and he puts up on a canvas a particular picture. And you're wondering, I, what's he doing as he's blending all these different paint colors together and, and puts together a beautiful picture? Uh, you know something the Lord Jesus took the giftings that he makes available and he blends them together and he designed you and me. Now, you may be similar to someone else in personality. You may be someone that's a twin. And so there's some physical features that are similar, but there's no one that's ever been like you. Never. You have been divinely, spiritually gifted of God. Can I just tell you that he tells us here in the scriptures, don't, don't think less of who you are. Don't minimize who you are. He uses the human body as the illustration. He says, look, there are different members of the body, the ears and the eyes and the fingers and the toes and the liver and the kidneys. I'm pointing like I know where they are. I don't know. But and he says, you take all of these elements of the human body, and he says, they all make up the human body, and we need them all. And he says, you are a part of the body of Christ. So don't minimize who you are. Don't, don't say to yourself, well, I'm not very well educated. Friends, if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, that progress of spiritual development is to continue. But I'm going to tell you something. God has gifted you to serve Him by serving other people in the household of God. Um, don't minimize who you are, and then don't maximize who you are, saying, I'm somebody special. Uh, verse 3 there says, let not any of us to think more highly of himself than he ought to think. Why? <laughs> because, man, you've just been gifted of God, that's all. You've been gifted of God to serve the Lord. What you have is not your own. What you have belongs to the Master. And there's going to be a day in which we're going to take what he's given us and present it back to him and say, I, I took what you gave me and I served with what you gave me. We are to be stewards, caretakers. Hey, teenagers, uh, teenage girls in particular, we're to be sitters, babysitters of what we've been given the responsibility to take care of. So don't minimize who you are and don't maximize who you are and don't misplace who you are. Don't try to be something that you're not. Don't say, well, I think that I ought to be a, a, a Sunday school teacher or I need to be a speaker or someone speaking the Word of God when you've not been gifted along that way. And then don't, don't give yourself the, the sense that you can, you can uh, somehow or another uh, do something in the area of music when maybe you've not been gifted in that way. I don't know what it may be that's going on in your world, but can I just plead with you to understand? God has gifted you. Don't try to be something that you're not. Be you. And he makes the comment here in our passage that we are to serve one 
another. If you'll notice what he says there in verse 5, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one, look at this, members one of another. I need you. And you need each other. And we need to be what God wants us to be to help the work of God to continue. Can I lay two or three things quickly on your heart? You need to pursue God's giftings that He's given to you. You need to find out what they are. You say, now, Brother Gleiser, how in the world will I ever know what God's given to me? It's like, it's like God has given you something. If I can take this eyeglass case here and I put it in my pocket, I can't see, I can't see it. It's hidden from view and so forth. And uh, as I begin to grow in the Lord, I, I, I hear some guy preach and he says, you need to pursue what is it that God has gifted you with? What is it? And you say, well, I don't know. Well, how do you find out? How do you pursue God's giftings. You do it one step at a time. You First of all, it's God's will that you be saved. To know that you're on your way to heaven. That is that your spiritual, eternal soul has been rescued by the rescuer, Jesus Christ. That's the will of God. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He wants you with Him in eternity, in glory. Come to Him tonight if you don't know Him. It's the greatest story, the greatest news you could ever hear, that God loves you. He always has. And He wants to save you. The first step to knowing what it is that God has gifted you with is to know that you're saved. And then the second step is sanctification. Look at verse 1 once again with me. It says, I plead with you, therefore, brethren, I beseech you, that you present your body as a living sacrifice. What does that mean? The word present there means to yield, to take your hands off the steering wheel, to just simply say, God, I, I give. I am not going to try to hijack what you have created. I belong to you. <laughs> and so, Lord, you can have me. I surrender. I give you my life, and I present my body unto you. Have you done that? Have you ever done that? Do you need to reignite that surrender? It's a sanctification. It is a surrender. It is a setting apart unto God. That's the next step. And then what happens is you start serving. So you get saved. You set yourself apart in availability to God. And then you just start serving. Did you notice in our passage that he said, he said, if you're a teacher, then start teaching. If you're an exhorter, start exhorting. If you're, if you're the one to, uh, to, to, if you've been gifted in the area of giving, then do it with liberality. And if you're an administrator, then do it with diligence. Okay. 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 What's he saying? He's saying, you find what God's gifted you to be by serving. It's an amazing thing. As you start serving the Lord, what things begin to open up and you begin to recognize this is who I am. It's as if this gifting that God's given you as you start serving him after a time, it begins to reveal itself. It begins to show itself. And you begin to say, you know, I really enjoy doing this. I can remember as a young man, I made myself available to the Lord as a teenager, and I said, God, I'll do anything you want me to do. I really will. And uh, I remember some ladies in our church asked me if I would speak to teach in the vacation Bible school in the summer to third and fourth grade boys. I think it was just boys. It might have been a mix of guys and girls, but I think it was just boys. And I looked at that lady and I said, are you serious? You want me? She goes, yes, I was probably 18, 19 years of age. I said, okay, I'll do it. I'll never forget what I spoke on. <laughs> I spoke on that Old Testament narrative of the man named Balaam, who had a donkey that talked to him. Now, you talk about an interesting story. I thought, well, maybe this will keep these boys and girls interested. I took that story and I illustrated it. I took the piano bench that was in the room and I made it my donkey. And I bounced around on this piano bench. And then when the donkey spoke 
uh, to Balaam. I got down on the floor and I looked back up like I was talking to Balaam and like the donkey spoke. I spoke to uh, uh, to Balaam. And then I stood up uh, as Balaam and I turned around and I talked to the donkey like Balaam did. And that conversation went on. Guess what? I kept those kids' attention. Uh, they probably thought, what a strange man we have in here today. But they paid attention. And then I probably spoke on the subject matter of you better obey God and do what he tells you to do, as we can learn from the life of Balaam. Now, wait a minute. I thought that was the absolute worst (laughs) message that anybody could have ever spoken on. And I remember leaving that room embarrassed. I was a shy kid. And I thought, man, they'll, they'll, they'll be sorry they asked me to do that. One of the ladies tracked me down out on the parking lot, and she said, Morris, that was good. And I thought, well, not only is she trying to be kind, she may have lost her mind. And that was not good. And I said, well, thank you. She said, would you be willing to come back and speak again? On Thursday? And I said, are you serious? You want me? She said, I do. You know what was beginning to happen? It was beginning to be revealed what God had gifted me to be. And that is a preacher. I went back and spoke again. After a season of time, people began to ask me to give devotionals and and to speak to a group of uh, guys that I was with in college. And I took the Bible and I began to present it. I started saying, now, Lord, if you don't want me to be a preacher, you better step in here and stop. Stop this. Stop me, because it looks like this is happening. I don't know what's going on, but you better stop me. And after a period of time, I said, God, I'm going to be a preacher unless you step in and stop me. And finally, it dawned on me. This desire in my heart to preach, it came from God. It certainly wouldn't have come from the devil. It came from God. And I got to do, and I'm still doing, what he, in my life, told me to be. And that is to be one who proclaims the truth with the giftings that he orchestrated and put together and framed into me. You say, well, Brother Morris said, that's, I'm not a preacher. Okay, all right, I get it. Vast majority of churches are not made up of preachers. But what is it that God's gifted you to be? What is it? You say, well, I don't know. Are you saved? You say, I am. Are you set apart unto God? Say, God, I'll do anything you want me to do. You say, well, I want to do that. Okay, tell him tonight. And then just start serving. Find an area and a place to serve. You know what I think you'll find? The things that you're pulled at, that you want to serve in, those will be the areas that are the desires of your heart that God's gifted you to do. Now, quickly, not only pursue God's giftings, but secondly, protect God's giftings. Protect them. Look at verse 2. What does he say? And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. He is saying this. Don't be pushed into the mold and the, and the, uh, the molding of this world because you've been gifted of God. You've been given a gift to serve Him. And so he says, don't let the world press you into its mold and become like the world. But no, 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 no. He says, let your mind be constantly renewed by the Word of God, by walking with God, so that you can understand what is the will of God for you, what He's gifted you to be and to do. Does it really matter? Let me just put it down here on the bottom shelf. Does it really matter what you watch on TV, what you uh, download on a computer? Does it really matter what movies you watch? Does it really matter what kind of friends you keep? Does it really matter what kind of language you use? Does it really matter if you're faithful to the house of God when you're able to come back? Does it really matter that you have any time with the Word of God and in prayer? Does it really make any difference? Absolutely it does. The answer is unequivocally, yes! Why? Because, friends, you've been gifted of God. Don't waste your life. 
Don't take what God's given you to be and say, ah, doesn't make any difference. Don't let the world press you into their mold because they're constantly working at it. But be ye constantly transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. It's like what the writer said in the book of Ecclesiastes. That would have been Solomon. He said this. He said, dead flies. What? Dead flies cause the ointment of the apothecary to send forth a stinking savor. Stop right there. What in the world is he saying? The apothecaries, the pharmacists, the, the, the people who worked with perfumes and oils would have those oils. And if ever they took the lid off of that oil and a fly would be drawn to it, and if those flies would die, it would cause the ointment and the oils and the perfumes to then start stinking. Why? Because he allowed into his perfume something that could harm it. He says, just like those dead flies cause the ointment to send, to send forth a stinking smell, he says, so doth a little folly him that is in reputation for wisdom. What? What's he saying? He's saying when you open up your life to the flies and the corruption of this world, your testimony will become ineffective. It will send forth a stinking testimony. Friends, it does matter the way in which we live. It really does. We live in a day of sloppy Christianity. People say, I can drink anything I want to because I'm still a Christian. I got the grace of God in my life. You may be a believer, but I'm going to tell you something. If you're spending your life in a world of alcohol and sp spending your life in a world that is contrary to the Word of God and messing around with that which is indecent, immoral, and inappropriate, and, and unfaithful to God, and you say, yeah, I, I just got a temper problem. It's, it's really no big deal. It's a big deal. Why? Because the point of the matter is, we're to protect what God's given us. He's gifted you. Don't waste your life by letting the world pull you into its mold. You got it? Pursue God's giftings. Protect God's giftings. And then finally, perfect God's giftings. Perfect them. Improve them. Take what God's given you and make the most of it. Do it. Why? For His name's sake. For God's glory. Here's what Paul said. Go back to our passage. He says here in verse uh, five, verse 6, Having then gifts differing. In other words, we're all different. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that's given to us. Whether prophecy, let us prophesy. The word prophecy is a word dealing with the matter of taking the truth and proclaiming it. It's like being a preacher. He says, if that's what you've been gifted to be, then do it. Then he says, uh, uh, he goes on to say, or uh, if you've been given the gift of ministry, which is a serving gift, that is that you you just love to do things, sometimes that are behind the scenes, uh, making meals for others and wiping down tables and setting up chairs and, and ushering and working in the nursery. And you just love to serve. And it's what God's gifted you to be. Now, does that mean that uh, people who've been given the gift of preaching should never serve? Absolutely not. We're all serving in our own way. But some people, they're just drawn to that gifting gift. He said, if you've been given the gift of ministry, then let us wait, that is, start serving with our ministering. In other words, he says, get with it. Then he goes on to say, if you've been gifted with teaching gift, then start teaching. If you've been given the gift of exhortation, which means you encourage people, you urge people on in their, in their work of God, then do it and start doing it. And he says, if you've been given the gift of administration, then do it with diligence. If, you, if you're a person who's been able to make money and you, and you just have a longing and a yearning to give more than we're all supposed to be giving, he says, then do it with cheerfulness and do it with liberality. What's he saying? He's saying this, perfect what God's gifted you to be. Are you just sitting in church, coming in and soaking things up, listening to a message like this right here, and never 
letting it bring about change in your life. Friends, listen, we've been gifted of God to do something for his sake. I say it like this. The gifts that we've been given to, uh, from the Lord, who we are, what we're supposed to be, I am supposed to serve him with a fervency and with a focus on fulfilling the gifting that he's given to me. I'm to do it for him, not for me, but for him. And this is what you need to remember. I'm What I serve when where I serve and how I serve is for him. Secondly, I don't just do it for him. I do it with him. This is incredible when you think about it. God doesn't send us out to serve him without his empowerment. He empowers you to do the work that he's gifted you to do and the life that he's caused and gifted you to be. You do it with him. He's there with you. He moved inside of you and the spirit of God empowers you to fulfill what he's wanting you to be. So I do it for him. I do it with him. How about this? I do it like him. Did you notice it says that we are the body of Christ? When Jesus was here on earth, he was functioning in all of the gifts of the spirit. He was the embodiment, embodiment of perfection. And in my place of ministry in the Lord's work and labor, I am simply supposed to do it like him. I'm to be an example of Christ. Does anybody ever see Jesus in you? I do it for him. I do it with him. I do it like him. I do it to him. And that is, when Jesus was here, he said, every time I give a a drink of cold water to one who's thirsty or a meal to someone who's hungry or I put clothes on someone who's unclothed or I visit the one who's imprisoned or who is sick. He, could, he said, it's as if you're doing it unto me. That's what Jesus said. You're doing it to me. Did you know that when I serve others, I am serving him. I'm doing it for him, with him, like him, to him, because someday we will stand before him. I have used this glass case as the example. There'll be a day in which I will take whatever giftings God's given me, and I'll turn it over and I'll say, Lord, I did this for you. Here's what I did. I stand before you. You know something, the only thing that I ever want to hear at a time like that, the only thing you're going to ever want to hear is this. Well done. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Well done. Nothing will mean more than that. When I was a boy playing baseball as a kid growing up, I can remember my daddy taught me how to play. He taught me how to field ground balls and throw it over to uh, some other base, and he taught me how to hit, and he taught me everything. My dad loved baseball, and so therefore he instilled it, in, instilled it into me. I love baseball. I remember as an eight-year-old boy, this is amazing what you can remember from your childhood days. I can remember as an eight-year-old boy, I can remember one day uh, playing in a game in which a, a fly, I was playing shortstop, and uh, there was a runner on first base from the opponent team. And, uh, and the next batter came up and hit a fly ball, and that ball came into the air. It was coming straight to me. I'm an eight-year-old boy now. The, f the thought of catching it was the first area of concern, just to catch it in my glove and to seal it. That would have been an out. But then the man that was on first base was supposed to stay on the base if I caught the ball, but he didn't do it. As the ball was coming down, he came running towards second base. I took that baseball after I caught it, and I threw it back over to my first baseman. He caught it and stepped on the bag. The umpire pointed at me and pointed at the first baseman, and he said, double play, two outs. <laughs> Look, man, when we got one out, we almost threw a party. I'm telling you, it was a big deal. To get two outs on one play, it was cool. I mean, it was just plain cool. Everybody on the field on our team threw their gloves in the air. I say everybody. Many of them did. And they, they waved their hats or threw them up in the air. It was a big deal. My coach was on the sideline. And he was applauding. But there was only one guy 
I wanted to see. There was only one person I wanted to see what he thought. He was up in the bleachers. And I turned my eyes over there toward the bleachers, and there stood my daddy, standing, standing up on the top rung with a big smile on his face, with his fist in the air, with a look on his eyes like, that was great. I'm proud of you. You know something, friends? It's nice when somebody appreciates what you do. It's nice if somebody pats you on the back or even applauds you. But when it comes right down to it, why we're here on this earth is for Him. I need to be like Him, with Him, and someday recognize I'm going to stand before Him. And that's the time you're going to want to hear Him say, Well done. Well done, my servant. I'm going to close. But let me ask you this, child of God, are you serving the Lord? Is there an area, an arena in your church family? Are you living from day to day with a heartbeat that says, I I want my life to count for God. He's got me here for a reason. Pursue what God has gifted you to be and to do. Protect it by making wise and scriptural choices in your daily life, moral, clean choices, and then perfect God's gifts in your life. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the opportunity we've had this week to open up the bread of life with those who have listened as members of Bethel Baptist Fellowship. Lord, I pray that it's been a shot in the arm for each one who's listened. I pray that each one will be strengthened to serve you more. We're grateful that you've not left us alone, even in a time in which we we feel cut off from one another. We're never cut off from you. I pray you'll comfort your people, strengthen and embolden them as they pursue the giftings that you've given them to serve you with. May we not waste our life. We ask it all in your beautiful and wonderful name. Amen. God bless you, friends. Thank you again.